Welcome back to AP Calculus BC. Um, our topic today is on convergent sequences. Well, we spent a couple days talking about what a sequence was. We defined sequences, talked about patterns of numbers, wrote formulas for all that fun stuff. Um, but today we're really going to get into um, a really important point about sequences that we're going to be using for really the rest of the semester. Um, so what I'd like you to do is please try these three graphs that are right here, or these three sequences, a sub n, b sub n, and c sub n, or c sub n plus 1, depending on what we're calling it. Um, your goal is to actually go through and graph each of these by hand. Now, as a heads up, when you graph each of these, um, because our domain is the natural numbers, then that means your inputs are just going to start at 1, and you're just going to input 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on and so forth. And I'm really going to ask that you only do maybe the first 8 terms. So you can have 1 comma something, 2 comma something, and so on and so forth. Um, looking at these, because our um, inputs are natural numbers, we are not going to need the quadrants 2 and 3. Those correspond to the negative side of the x-axis. So I think when you graph each of these, really you're just going to be graphing something like this, where you have your x's and your y's, and your graph is just going to take up this space, or maybe if everything's positive, it will just take up this space. Um, the last thing that you should keep in mind is um, that because our domain is discrete here, it's not continuous, right? We aren't plugging in 1, 1 1.01, 1 1.02, right? We're not getting tons and tons of super close dots that we can connect. Um, we say this is a discrete graph, not continuous, and sequences are always discrete. Uh, which means when you actually go through and you graph your various points, so if you have 1, 2, all the way up to 8, your graph is not going to be some smooth line. Instead, it's just going to be 8 distinct points. We want to see the individual points. Um, once you guys finish this, I'm going to show you how you can do this on your calculator, um, but I think it is important to try by hand as well. I think you get a much better idea, especially what's going to happen with this negative 1 to the end or this recursive formula down here. So go ahead and pause the video, try to graph all three of these by hand, it'll take you a little while, and then once you're done, make sure your graphing calculator is ready, um, and we will go through and do it on the graphing calculator. All right, you should have unpaused me, and I hope that you are ready to go. Um, we, I think, we should jump to our calculator. Now, the first thing you might try and do is graph one of these on Desmos, and that's okay, right? If I wanted to graph a sub n equals 1 divided by 2 to the nth power, I actually already have it already graphed here. Um, we said the domain is only natural numbers, though, um, and it's a little bit tricky to do that on Desmos. I can at least do n greater than or equal to 1, and it looks like that, but really what should happen is I just have individual points at 1, at 2, at 3. I don't want that continuous. So I can hold or long click on the color and choose something like this so you can see the individual points, but even still, that's really not quite what we're looking for. So I'm actually not going to be using Desmos for the sequence portion of this. You can still get an idea of the graph, nothing bad there, but um, let's jump over to your calculators and make sure that you know how to do sequences on your calculators. Um, in particular, we're going to go ahead and pull up the Inspire first. I will show you how to do this on the 84 in a second. Um, and we're actually going to access our sequence input mode on the Inspire. So again, you can click your switching between the um, calculation screen and the graphing screen. I want to be on the graphing screen. You can hit tab a couple times to get up to your function input. It um, doesn't really matter where you are, though, because you're going to choose Menu, Graph Entry Edit, and then we are working on sequences, which I think you can tell is number 7. And then we're just going to do 1, just a regular sequence. You can play around with custom on your own if you'd like. Um, and then you get something that's actually in function notation. So this is u1 of n. So what they're doing is instead of writing the function like this, they're actually saying, um, they called theirs u, but ours is a. They're saying a, so a of n equals 1 over 2 to the n. So they're using function notation instead of subscripts, but it's really going to do the same thing. Um, so we're going to use our function here, and we're going to make a quick fraction, and it's going to be 1 over 2 to the power of, and you do need to use n because the input is clearly n here. Initial terms, that doesn't matter. Um, n step equals 1, 
Um, this is only going to graph individual discrete points. It's going to not connect anything. So it's saying end step of 1 and go from 1 to 99. What that's saying is the very first value you want to plug in is 1. And then the next value you want to plug in is 1 higher than that, which would be 2, and then 1 higher than that, all the way up till you get to 99. If I hit enter, we should see our nice graph right here. And you'll notice here's your first point, second, so on and so forth. And if you go to the right, you'll notice that eventually the sequence, actually very quickly, the sequence kind of flatlines on our um, on our x-axis. So uh, your paper should contain eight points, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ending with one over two to the eighth power. Um, so hopefully yours looks something like that. Let's go ahead and take a look at the second one. Um, the second one I will also do on the Inspire. I'll show you the 84 after all of this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do Menu, back up to Entry Edit. Actually, I can do Tab to get there faster. And you'll actually notice that I already have this plugged in on the second one. Um, I just wanted to make sure I was quick here. So I'm going to go ahead and just um, click this one on. I'll go up and turn this one off so we don't get confused. And you'll notice that this one's pretty cool. It starts on the negative side of the y-axis and then goes up and down, up and down, up and down. We say the sequence oscillates. Right, it bounces back and forth. Okay, um, and you again should have eight points on here. The last one, and I'm going to clear everything out just so I don't get too confused. Um, our last sequence, though, is very interesting because our last sequence is recursively defined, or as your book calls it, it's a recurrence relation. So if it's recursively defined, how do we do that in our calculator? Well, first, your calculator is not going to use this n plus 1 notation, which is why I mentioned I don't actually prefer that notation. Your calculator is going to do something like this. It would define this function as, and something very similar, but it's going to say c of n equals negative 2 times c of n minus 1. Right, so instead of having n plus 1 and n, it bumps everything back and has n and n minus 1. That's how I prefer to define my sequences, too. I'm not quite sure why your book does it differently. And again, that's equivalent to basically saying... <coughs> Sorry. Quick cough. <coughs> that's essentially equivalent to saying c sub n equals negative 2 times c sub n minus 1. Same thing. And then um, c of 1 is 1 versus c sub 1 is 1. Same idea. Um, and we're going to need that notation for our calculator. So calculator-wise, menu, entry, edit, and then back to sequence. And sequence, we could have just hit tab. Um, here's my equation. It says u sub 1 of n equals, well, this is called sequence u sub 1 of n. So when I do negative 2 times, I want to do, I want to call the sequence in its own definition, u sub 1 of, but not n, n minus 1. And so this is basically saying, um, in order to find a new term in u sub 1, we use a term 1 previous and multiply by negative 2. Now, this is going to graph nothing, and it's going to graph nothing because it doesn't have an initial term to begin with. However, we have an initial term, and our initial term here is 1. If I hit enter, we should see our sequence. Our sequence looks very strange. We're like, uh, wait, it went down here, up here. Where'd it go? Well, you're multiplying by negative 2 every time. So after 4 by negative 2, you'll get negative 8. It's down off the screen. So maybe a quick window change would see it all for us, right? Window, and then I'm going to do window settings. I always like to set my own. I think it's good practice for you. Um, we only need to go on the x-axis over to 8, so maybe we'll go to 9. Um, and then my y's are going to get pretty big pretty fast. Uh, maybe we'll go up to like 128. That's a power of 2. Let's do negative 128 to 128. And we can leave the scale on auto. There we go. That's looking better. So we started here, and then we went down. That's 2. Here's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then there is 8 hiding way down there. And you'll notice that it's starting to get further and further away from the x-axis, which it makes sense because you're multiplying by negative 2 every time. How do we do this on the 84, in case you're following along on that? Um, it's a pretty similar situation. I'm just going to show the recursive version. Um, you'll notice if you go to graph a sequence on here and hit y equals, um, you, of course, get to your y, y1, y2. Um, and if you hit this x, t, theta, n button, x comes out. All right, well, what we're going to do is we're going to change the graphing mode. So we're going to go to mode, 
And we're going to go down and you'll notice there are four modes and each of these four modes are linked to the four variables on this key. So I'm going to go over so we have our function, parametric, polar, and sequential modes. I'm going to go over to sequence, hit enter. Okay, and then you'll notice that you have two options down here. Connected means connect all the you know points on the graph versus dot and a dot would be just you know do individual points. Um, I'm going to go ahead and select dot for now and then we're going to go back to y equals. When you get into y equals they're going to give you a couple things up here. First they're going to say what term number do you want to start at and we're always going to start at one so there's a one automatically up there. You can change it if you want but no reason to. And then it says what formula do you want to use? Well let's use our same formula here. They use u of n and that's going to be equal to negative 2 times. Now they're using the function name u, so I actually need to do alpha and then find the u down here. I think it's above the 7 in blue, so I hit second first and then 7. Oops, and I lied. It was, oh, I hit alpha. <laughs> second 7, not alpha 7. u of, and then notice they're using n here, but that's on my key right here, n minus 1. Now again, this would graph nothing because we don't have other terms, so we do actually need our first term down here. What is my first term? Well, we said my first term is 1. And then a couple things to note. First, up above, this over here that I just selected is already in this dot mode. If you hit enter on it, it changes to different modes. You can have a really solid dark line, you can have this dot mode, you can have lots of small dots, so you can change the different modes in here. I'll just leave it as normal, but if you ever did want to play around with that, and you can do that on regular y equals 2, um, that's a pretty nifty trick that not everyone knows about. I'll hit graph, and you can see the same thing. Here's my first one, second one, third one, fourth one, and so on and so forth. We could also, of course, change our axes. All right, now that we covered graphing on the calculator, um, how do we describe each of the graphs of those sequences? Well, the first graph over here, and actually let's switch things around so we can see what's going on. Um, the first graph right here went through and you really just had to worry about the first quadrant and the graph you know, started kind of right about here and then just dropped down and very quickly kind of hovered right above the x-axis. Our second graph did that cool oscillation where it went back and forth, but it was pretty similar to the first graph where it was kind of here, it was kind of a large distance away, and then it was closer, closer, and then eventually it kind of just settles on the x-axis and you can't even tell it's bouncing back and forth, right? It oscillates again, right, if I wanted to connect them all. Versus our last graph we saw kind of did that opposite oscillation where instead of oscillating and getting closer to the x-axis, um, this last one started close to the x-axis and then started getting further and further away. So it looks, you know, something like this, right? Um, so kind of the opposite of the second one. Well, how do you describe those? Well, you can use whatever words you want. It gets closer to the x-axis, it gets further away, they approach an asymptote, they don't approach an asymptote, the end behavior is this, end behavior is that. Um, and because there are so many different ways to describe this, um, we're actually going to go ahead and do a decent amount of terminology and vocabulary today. It's really our one big day on this. So let's get to it. Um, graphs give us a really nice indication if a sequence converges to a specific number. Um, we've called the number to which a sequence, or rather a function in the past, converges a horizontal asymptote. Okay, and so we can see that up above. I think this has a horizontal asymptote of zero. We get close to zero. Um, my second one has a horizontal asymptote of zero. We're getting closer and closer. But my last one, because we're getting further and further away, does not have a horizontal asymptote. Okay, or another way to put it is these two converge to zero. Right, the horizontal asymptote's at zero. This last sequence does not converge at all. In fact, when a sequence does not converge to a number, we say the sequence diverges. And that's vocabulary we've heard before when we do indefinite integrals, those integrals with infinity. Uh, we talked about how if there's no answer, we say the integral diverges. Same vocabulary here. Now, I have a whole bunch of vocabulary phrases for you, and I included an example on each one of these. Um, it's up to you. You could go through and try to look each of them up. 
you could define them in your own words, whatever sounds good. Um, I'm probably not going to write too much down on these. You should probably write down a quick definition, but I'll at least go through them in words. Um, but as usual, pause this video, and then once you're confident with each of them, or if you need some help, you can unpause. All right, now that we're back, let's do a quick rundown. Well, a convergent sequence is, we just talked about, a sequence that's going to converge to a various value. Most of the sequences we see today are going to converge to zero. Um, however, they don't have to, right? If you took this sequence out further, you did 16, 8, 4, 2. We're just dividing by 2 every time, I think, right? We get 1 half, 1 quarter, 1 eighth. This sequence is definitely converging to zero. However, if you added 1 to every value, right, something like this, um, I know I'm going to make some sort of really easy computational mistake, but that's okay. Um, you know, something like this. Then this sequence converges to 1. However, most of the sequences we see aren't going to have a plus 1 or a plus 7 or something. It's just going to be the basic sequence. But either way, converging to a value. The sequence could also be negative and converge to a value above it, too. A divergent sequence is one that doesn't converge to a value. You'll notice that this sequence, every output is getting larger, or I guess the absolute value of every output is getting larger, and it's never going to converge to anything. An increasing sequence is, of course, a sequence that is going to increase in value as you move from one term to the next. Sometimes you'll hear that defined as the n plus first term is greater than the nth term. Not greater than or equal, strictly greater than. So this next term over here to be increasing would have to be 4 or 3.1 or something. It could not be 3 because that's not greater. Decreasing, same exact thing, except then we'd say the n plus first term would have to be less than the term that came before it. But then what about non-decreasing and non-increasing? That seems like a convoluted way to say something. I mean, non-decreasing, doesn't that mean increasing? Um, well, no, it doesn't actually. It means it's either increasing or constant. And so you'll look at this one and we increase, we increase, and then we stay constant and stay constant and then we increase and then we increase. So a lot of times non-decreasing sequences are written where n plus 1 is greater than or equal to the previous term. And same thing with non-increasing. We have n plus 1 that's less than the previous term However, it could be less than or equal in the case of the two fours that are right here. Okay, last two, monotonic and bounded. Well, monotonic, think monotonous. If I speak like this, I am talking in a monotone sort of voice. This is monotonous. Um, monotonic is similar to that, except monotonic means you are either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. You're not non-increasing or non-decreasing. So this sequence right here is, you could say, increasing monotonically. Mono, oops, apparently spelling's hard. Monotonically. Haha, <laughs> we did it. But you could just say it's a monotonic sequence, and that's a nice way to talk about sequences um, because it tells you that either you're strictly getting bigger or strictly getting smaller, um, and it turns out that there are a lot of interesting properties with monotonic sequences. The last type of sequence is your bounded sequence, and the idea of a bounded sequence is you could pick some value. M. We usually use M to stand for either a maximum or a minimum, and we're going to choose that so that the sequence will stay either less than that value of M or greater than that value of M for all values of M. For example, my first sequence right here, we could bound this sequence by using M equals 2. Clearly that sequence is going to be smaller than 2 at all time. You could say the maximum uh, the max bound, the upper bound, is 2. This sequence over here, you could use a whole bunch of bounds. You could say the sequence is going to have a lower bound of negative 4 and an upper bound of positive 4 because it's oscillating again. Um, you sometimes can get away with just saying negative 3 and 3 um, because sometimes you can be equal to the bound. But either way, a bound is just a number, and we're not going to use this too often yet, but eventually we will, um, that you can say, I know with all confidence the sequence is smaller than this, or bigger than this, or at least in between those two. Last but not least, technically, when we're finding the value to which a sequence converges, we are finding the limit of the sequence as x 
Nope, shouldn't use x. We use n with our sequences as n approaches infinity. Therefore, we say a sequence converges to a number l if and only if the limit as n approaches infinity of the general term equals some sort of limit. And of course, a sequence will diverge if when you take the limit of the sequence you get an answer of infinity or negative infinity or does not exist. But we need to be a little careful because limits talk about what happens as you get infinitely close to a value, right? I mean, if you pictured a graph, and you probably don't need to draw this, um, but if you said this is the point 2 and you're working with limits, right, 1, 2, and 3, and let's say that this point is 1 and, you know, this point's over here and you're like, oh, well, if it's a sequence, what's happening as we get really, really close to two on each side? We don't know because our sequence is just individual points. Versus if this was actually a function and our function was infinitely close, we'd be pretty confident that's where the limit is. But what if on either side of two, and we were just pretending here that our sequence kind of went up like this and this other part went down here, well, then that limit wouldn't exist. So. Are we allowed to apply limit laws to these discrete sequences? Go ahead and jot down what you think, and then whenever you're ready, you can turn the page. And I just mentioned this, but it's kind of nice to see the difference in notation, but um, there are slight differences in these two formulas. Um, usually the subscript notation, and a lot of times you'll even see it given like this, um, is an indicator that we're dealing with a sequence. And a sequence only has a domain of natural numbers, it's discrete, you plot individual points, you don't connect the graph. Versus this function notation, and usually x is a good giveaway here, um, is um, just a traditional function, right? That This isn't continuous everywhere, you can't use negative 1, but it's generally continuous everywhere except negative 1, um, so you would definitely connect this graph. Now, although we haven't talked about limits at other values, it does turn out that a correspondence between sequences and functions is that their limits at infinity are equal and found in the same way. Uh, and that shouldn't shock you too much, because if you're taking a sequence out infinitely far, eventually all the outputs, even if it, even if you're not sure what happens in between here, eventually all the outputs will approach a number, or they won't. Um, and a function has, of course, the same thing. I mean, it's a continuous function, you have all these outputs, but there's going to be no difference at infinity. So a little bit more formally, if you have this discrete sequence represented by the general term in curly braces, and a continuous function, then if the limit as n approaches infinity of the function is, equals a number, then the limit as n approaches infinity of that sequence also equals that number. So what this allows us to do is say, well, we have this sequence that I don't know many limit laws about, well, we can just treat it as a function, at least if we're going towards infinity. And that is going to allow us to use all of our usual limit laws. Um, if you need a review of all that, you can go look at page 610 on your textbook. Now, there is one more piece um, regarding limits, um, and that is the piece of having this alternating factor of negative 1 to the n or negative 1 to the n plus 1. You saw something like that on your opener. Um, whenever you take the limit of that, right, if I take the limit as we go out to infinity, if I just did it of this function, then right around infinity, if you're using odd numbers, you're going to get 1, and you're using even numbers. No, nope, odd numbers will get negative 1. Even numbers, you will get positive 1. Um, and that's kind of an issue, because the limit any time you do this will not exist. So there's actually going to be three outcomes when you have negative 1 to the n in your limit, and we're going to work on those shortcuts right now. Um, if the limit converges to 0 without the alternating factor, basically meaning ignore that this is in here, then if your limit equals 0, then if you put the alternating factor in there, the limit's still 0. If the limit converges to a value that's not 0 without this factor, then our limit oscillates, and therefore it doesn't exist. It means our sequence diverges. And if the limit diverges without the factor, then the limit will also diverge with the factor. And it shouldn't shock you too much. I mean, we even saw some of these on the opener, too, I think, right? We, um, we could go through and you have this sequence that, let's say, without the alternating factor, it's going to zero. 
Well, with the alternating factor, that's just going to be every other point is going to be in the exact same spot, but just on the negative side, and it's still going to go to zero, right? That's basically what this first one's saying. However, and this is where things get really interesting, um, if this limit, and this is our second one, if the limit is approaching a different number besides zero, let's say it's approaching one or something like that, um, without the alternating factor, if you're getting closer and closer to one, but then you put in the alternating factor, um, the alternating factor isn't going to flip it just below. It's going to make that y value negative. So instead of just above 1, like 1 1.1, it's going to be negative 1.1, and it's going to be down here. Whoops, negative 1.1 is real far down, sorry. should be something like this. And so what's going to end up happening is at infinity, you're going to bounce back and forth between the negative and positive version of this 1. So at infinity on this second one, you're going to either get, let's say that without the factor, it approaches 1. Well, at infinity, it's going to go negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1. And so therefore, the limit would not exist. And then the last one isn't a surprise. If it's going to infinity, and then you put in that negative alternating factor, now it goes and it bounces, oscillates between negative infinity and positive infinity. Well, how does that help? We'll see this in just a second. Um, there are six limit problems here for you to work through. Um, go ahead and get those done, and then if you would um, like me to explain them, you can listen to the video, and if not, then you can just skim through the answers and move on to the next page. Okay, limits for each of these. What are we doing here? Um, I think most of this is going to be done with dominance. The limit is n approaches infinity, 3n cubed over n cubed plus 1. Don't forget that basically dominance, maybe I'll work uh, downwards here, um, says that at infinity, there's really no difference between the graph of n cubed plus 1 versus just n cubed. Adding 1 to an infinitely large number is still infinitely large. And so by leaving off the non-dominant factors in the, non in the denominator or numerator, um, you can make things go pretty well. These cancel, and it ends up just getting 3. Therefore, this sequence will converge to 3. You can plug in lots and lots of numbers in here, but eventually they will all approach the value 3. B sub n, very, very similar. Um, there is definitely a little bit more to a square root function. Um, you might even want to review this in my Algebra um, AB playlist when we do limits at infinity. I think it's day 5 in there. Um, because there are some good important things, especially when we go to negative infinity. Um, however, we're just going to use dominance quickly here, and I think it should get us our answer since we're going to positive infinity. That plus 2 in the numerator isn't going to do anything for us. This allows us to simplify, and we can say that the square root of 16n squared is equivalent to 4n, and that is true as long as you're going to positive infinity. It's not a negative infinity. These cancel, and it gives us the value of the limit of our sequence. Third one, negative 1 to the n. Well, there's that alternating factor. Really what we're going to do is take the limit of the sequence without the alternating factor, because there's only three options that are going to happen. We're just going to look at the answer to the limit and then decide what the alternating factor is telling us. Okay, dominance again, nothing too crazy. I'm going to leave off that plus 1. These cancel and leaves us with 1. However, technically there is still this alternating factor down here, and this alternating factor is really going to make at infinity this 1 alternate between 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1. And so since we got that 1, which is not equal to 0, then this sequence, c sub n, is going to diverge. Right? Because if you were to take the limit of this, your limit would be negative 1, positive 1, negative 1. It doesn't actually approach a specific number, so our sequence diverges. <clears throat> this is another application of dominance down here. Um, we need to remember which functions are more dominant than others. Um, and we should probably remember that natural log looks like this. It's concave down. It goes up very slowly versus n goes up faster. No concavity as opposed to negative concavity. Um, so in terms of dominance, we can say that this limit is equivalent to 1 over n. Instead of natural log, natural log, who cares? It's going to be blotted out by that n in the denominator. It goes, it gets so much larger than natural log. And then, of course, a constant over infinity is 0. <clears throat> 
And we should probably say, like, therefore converges. I probably should have said that on each one, that each of them converge. Our next one, the limit as n approaches infinity of n divided by natural log of n, not 2n, good enough. Uh, well, this is pretty much the same thing as before, except now it's going to be n over 1. n still goes to infinity faster than natural log. And then if you substitute in infinity, which we don't really like to do, um, we can just say that this limit approaches infinity. Um, you could also say does not exist. However, regardless, our sequence E sub n is going to diverge. Okay. So let's go ahead and finish off our last one here. Um, and the last one asks us about the limit. What color haven't I used yet? There we go. The limit is n approaches infinity of e to the n over n factorial. Ooh, that one's going to be a little tricky here. Um, well, what we need to realize is that e to the n at infinity really means do e times itself and infinite number of times, and e is the number 2.7. So we're multiplying 2.7 times 2.7 times 2.7, blah, 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 blah. n factorial at infinity is weird. n factorial is first going to take the absolute largest number you can think of, something infinitely large, and then it's going to multiply by that number, but one smaller, and then one smaller than that. And eventually, with our factorial, we'll get down to 3 times 2 times 1. Well, which one's larger? Well, notice that here you're multiplying all of these numbers down to 3 times each other, and I'm pretty sure that all those numbers are larger than all of these because these are all 2.7 at the top. So we're multiplying all sorts of numbers that are larger than 2.7, and then at the very end we do 2 times 1, so that's slightly smaller. But we already did an infinite number of numbers larger than 2.7. I'm pretty sure that n factorial is much larger than e to the n. That double greater than means much larger, right? Um, so in terms of dominance here, I think that factorial is really going to dominate out our exponential, and so we end up with 0. Now, there is one thing that we didn't cover um, before, and that is where n factorial fits into our progression of dominance. We just, I think, gave a nice little proof to show that n factorial is going to be greater than a number to the nth power, like e to the n. So n factorial is definitely either going to be here or here. Well, using similar logic to the previous page, see if you can prove to yourself which one is more dominant. Well, hopefully you were able to come up with some sort of proof here. Don't forget that n to the nth means we're taking n and multiplying it by itself n number of times, right? And at infinity, that's really infinity times itself over and over and over again. However, n factorial is defined as n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times eventually ending up with 3 times 2 times 1. Well, if you compare these term to term, I think you can probably see that this n to the nth is going to be larger or more dominant than n factorial. So really this n factorial belongs right here, with n to the nth still being the most dominant. Now that you know that, let's go ahead and decide whether these sequences converge or diverge to a specific number. And we're going to justify, of course, by using limits. Um, it is possible to use L'Hopital with some of these as well, right? We could take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the um, denominator, but I think you'll find that L'Hopital's rule is really obnoxious with large powers because you're going to have to do it a minimum of 10 times to get your denominator or numerator to change to something, and I think you'll find dominance is just a little bit quicker. All right, the limit is n approaches infinity of natural log of n to the 10th. Um, I bet you're going to be convinced that the numerator is less dominant than the denominator. This is n to the first, always more dominant than natural log. Um, you could rewrite this if you wanted. Um, you could pull this 10 out front, remembering your properties of logarithms. Um, and then you might even be able to convince yourself even more. You can even factor out the 10 and you could factor out this piece over here so it really just leaves you with natural log over n uh, but you can keep those in. It doesn't really make a difference. Ultimately it's going to be equivalent to really just like 1 over 0 0.1234 
to the nth. Substitute in infinity, constant over infinity, we get 0. The sequence is going to converge to 0. Our next one um, is really testing to make sure that you remember how to rewrite these um, so that you can compare the exponents. Don't forget that this index here is always going to be the denominator and your power is going to stay a power um, divided by n to the 3 fifths. Okay, well what do we do now? Um, you could just subtract these two. I mean, why not, right? As we go through, we know that our properties of exponents say that we can do 2 thirds minus 3 fifths, um, or maybe with some common denominators we can be a little more successful. It's like fifteenths, right? 10 fifteenths minus 9 fifteenths um, is going to be the limit as n approaches infinity of n to the 1 fifteenth. Okay, well this is in the numerator of a fraction. If it was negative it would have moved to the denominator. We'd have an entirely different result if it was negative, but this is a positive exponent. And so I think this limit is going to go to infinity, which means then therefore that our sequence diverges. Okay, let's look at a couple more. n factorial over 10 to the nth. n factorial is definitely the more dominant of these two, so really what we're finding here is just n factorial over 1, and so that is going to be infinity, which means our sequence is going to again diverge. 3 to go. Um, as you can tell, I had to add in some limits of exponentials, but I did that, so I think we're going to be okay here. Um, how do we take the limit as n approaches infinity of this? Well, let's find out. Um, I think we could probably simplify the denominator a little bit first. Um, so we have 3 to the n minus 5. The denominator, though, we can split as 3 to the n times 3 to the first. Remembering our exponent rules, we have the same base, so we add the exponents. In terms of dominance, then, I think we can say this is 3 to the n divided by 3 to the n, right? This is not dominant, this is not dominant. Um, however, this is multiplying, so I think we probably, um, yeah, I think that multiplication, maybe I'll factor out that one-third, something like this, right? Um, and then we can see that this right here becomes 1, right, because those cancel out. And then we get one-third times 1, so I'm getting one-third as my limit here. Two more. Um, very, very similar problem, but for this one, um, we have an n minus 1 in the denominator. I wonder how that'll throw things off. 3 to the n minus 5 divided by 3 to the n times 3 to the negative first. Okay, a little bit of dominance for the numerator to start. Um, actually, let's even do the same thing we did before. We'll factor out the 1 over 3 to the negative first, and then we get 3 to the nth divided by 3 to the nth. I'm going to move that negative exponent to the numerator to keep a positive power. These cancel to make 1, and I think we end up getting 3 here. Cool. One more. 3 to the n minus 5 over 3 to the n plus 5. Oh yeah, this one looks just like dominance to me. I think we get 3 to the n over 3 to the n, we just get 1. Nice. Easy one to finish off. Okay, last but not least. Let s and t be positive numbers. Determine and justify whether the sequence a sub n equals s divided by t to the nth power converges if s is less than t. Um, let's just make up some numbers. So we're working with a sub n equals s divided by t to the nth power each time. Well, s is less than t. Um, so let's see, what would make s less than t? Um, well, how about if s was 5 and t was 7. So we'd get 5 sevenths to the nth. Um, does this converge or diverge? Well, there's a couple ways to deal with this. I think maybe the long way around here is we could take, of course, the limit as n approaches infinity. And we could even distribute in that exponent 5 to the n over 7 to the nth. And then we think, well, what's more dominant? Well, definitely 7 to the nth. It has a larger base than 5 to the nth. So we'd say it becomes 1 over 7 to the nth, which is 0. Now, another way you could do it is you could think, well, if n approaches infinity, that means you're multiplying 5 sevenths times itself an infinite number of times. 
And 5 sevenths is a number that's smaller than 1. It's between 0 and 1. So what happens if you multiply by a number between 0 and 1? Well, your answers get smaller. Imagine multiplying by 1 half. If you have $10 and you multiply by a half, now you have 5. By a half, now you have $2.50. By a half, now you have $1.25. And I think it's going to approach 0 every time you multiply by this. Right, this is definitely going to approach zero. So um, to me, because you get an answer of zero, this will always cause your sequence to converge. What about s greater than t? Maybe I'll pick three greater than two this time. So we end up with three halves to the t power. Now we're multiplying by a number larger than um, one, three halves, 1 1.5. And when you multiply by a number larger than one, um, don't your values just get bigger and bigger and bigger? They go forever? Of course, a way you can see that is just by using a limit as n approaches infinity. 3 to that, I don't know why I used a t here. It's contagious. 3 to the n over 2 to the n. 3 to the n is more dominant than 2 to the n, so we get 3 to the n over 1, which is infinitely large. Therefore, we will diverge. Well, what happens if they are equal to each other? Let's pick, I don't know, 4 equals 4, whatever sounds fun to you. a to the n equals 4 divided by 4 to the nth, or simplifying 1 to the nth. But imagine you just do 1 times itself an infinite number of times. Isn't that just 1? So my sequence here is just 1 over and over and over again. No matter what you plug in for your input, you get an output of 1. I'm pretty sure then that we converge to 1. So you do have a little bit of book work today. Um, there's going to be some good limit practice on here. You're going to um, first practice writing out some terms without using limits and seeing if they actually converge or diverge. Um, and then you're going to give a few examples and practice some limits at the end. As always, I have all of this, all of the solutions worked out for you in the files section of Teams. If you have any questions or if I made any mistakes, please let me know. Thank you for all your hard work.